We were also told that there was a wife of a known terrorist who is one of the protesters on Columbia University's campus. Here is Ali Bauman, a local CBS New York affiliate reporter <coughs> who, and again, they just are fed this by the New York Police Department and they just write it down and spread it without the slightest concern for whether or not it's true. The uh, tweet reads from Ali Berman, quote, New York City Hall sources tell CBS evidence that the wife of a known terrorist is with protesters on Columbia University campus. And there she, she deleted the tweet afterward because the claim was so preposterous. The wife of a known terrorist was present on Columbia's campus. Here is CNN spreading the same report. And listen to what it is that they said to try and make these protests sound as sinister as possible. Here's Laura Coates last night reporting on the protests by repeating what the NYPD told her. And we're learning tonight that the wife of an indicted terrorist was on the campus last week. It was pointed to a post on X by Sami al Aryan, a former University of Southern Florida professor who pleaded guilty to a charge of conspiring to provide services to the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in 2006. He posted on X last week, showing a photo of his wife on the campus of Columbia University, saying, quote, my wife Nala in solidarity with the brave and very determined Columbia University students. So none of this was hidden. The quote unquote known terrorist posted a photo of his elderly wife. She's in her, I believe now mid 60s, maybe even older, who was on the campus in solidarity with the protesters because they're Palestinians. And he proudly tweeted that quote, my wife Nala in solidarity with the brave and very determined Columbia University students. Now this was, this claim was spread all around social media by Israel supporters to make it seem like this was a terrorist attack that was happening on Columbia rather than what it was. A peaceful protest of unarmed students, every single one of them that was arrested at Columbia was a student even though there were claims that they were composed mostly of outsiders. They were all students. But because they were with the wife of a known terrorist, you were supposed to believe that this was kind of very sinister and menacing terroristic act that we needed our paramilitarized police to put a stop to. Now, as I said, the case of Sammy L. Aryan was one that I reported on extensively throughout the Bush years and then into the Obama years. And in 2015, along with my colleague at The Intercept, Murtaza Hussein, I, we published an interview, an exclusive interview with Samuel Aryan, the professor who defeated a controversial terrorism charge and then got deported from the U.S. And the reason I spent so much time reporting on this case is was because it was the first test case to see how far they could stretch the Patriot Act and all of the new powers that they had. And the FBI took this person, Samuel Aryan, who was in the United States for years as a college professor. In fact, he raised money for George Bush's 2000 campaign. He met with President Bush by himself. If he were some kind of terrorist, he could have like taken a pen and stabbed President Bush with. He had lived in the United States without incident forever, but he was definitely an advocate of the Palestinian cause. He raised money and sent it to Gaza and charities that the US government decided to use the Patriot Act to claim that they, they were, these charities were linked to designated terrorist organizations in Gaza, and as a result, he was accused of material support for terrorism, a felony that if he were convicted of it, would send him to prison for the rest of his life. And they put him on trial, and because of the Patriot Act, they were able to spy on his telephone conversations for years. And despite all of those pages and all of those years of transcripts of hearing and listening and surveilling what he was doing and saying, the jury listened to all of that evidence and acquitted him. Do you know how hard it is to get an acquittal in a terrorism case against an Arab man in the United States in the years right after 9-11? It's basically impossible. The federal judges, the federal courts are all wildly pro-prosecution. And for a jury not even to split but to acquit on this charge of material uh, supporting terrorist organizations shows you how dubious this case was from the start. It was just an attempt to punish somebody who was a critic of Israel under these new laws, under the Patriot Act, that they got. Now, here in the LA Times in December of 2005, which is when they had the trial, there you see ex-professor is acquitted 
in the Patriot Act test case, quote, in a case closely watched as a key test of the Patriot Act, a former university professor accused of helping lead a Palestinian terrorist organization was acquitted Tuesday on nearly half of the charges against him and the jury deadlocked on the rest. Samuel Aryan, who taught computer engineering at the University of South Florida in Tampa, wept and embraced his lawyer after the federal jury found him not guilty on eight of 17 counts, including conspiring to murder and maim people outside the United States. The panel deadlocked on charges that he had, among other things, engaged in money laundering and attempting to illegally obtain U.S. citizenship. So just these minor charges they tacked on that had nothing to do with him supposedly being a terrorist leader. And that didn't stop everybody last night, including CNN, from screeching that a wife of a known terrorist, mean namely Samuel Arian, who was acquitted of the charges, was present at the Columbia protest. Now, amazingly, after he was acquitted and there was a hung jury, the Justice Department did not let him go. Almost immediately after they charged him with another crime, namely contempt because of his refusal to testify in another case, and a federal court judge ordered him to be confined to home imprisonment, and they filed a motion to dismiss, to dismiss, dis, dismiss the charges. And the federal judge in New York, Lorena Brinkman, sat on the motion. She just refused to decide the motion, not for months, but for years. She just didn't rule on it. And as a result, he remained charged the second time, went to prison again, then was put into home uh, prison. He was not able to leave his house. That's where I first interviewed him and met him and his family. And then here's Politico in June of 2014. So it was an eight-year ordeal after he was first acquitted. The feds drop the El Arian prosecution. Quote, the Justice Department has dropped a long-stalled second criminal prosecution of a former college professor who pleaded guilty to aiding a terrorist group following a high-profile trial in Florida that ended with a muddled verdict almost a decade ago. Federal prosecutors in Alexandria, Virginia, filed a motion seeking to dismiss a criminal contempt indictment brought in 2008 against former University of South Florida mechanical engineer Professor Samuel Aryan, who was born in Kuwait to Palestinian parents. In the new filing, prosecutors said they decided to give up on the contempt case after delays precipitated by U.S. District Court Judge Leonie Brink, uh, Brinkema sitting for years on a critical motion in the case without ruling one way or another. So this is the person that we were told was the known terrorist whose wife was found to be president at Columbia and people who were Israel supporters spread this and use this continuously in order to try and imply that the protest at Columbia was not what it was, namely a peaceful political protest objecting to the Israeli war in Gaza, but instead that it was some sort of gathering of terrorists who wanted to violently attack the United States and therefore some sort of massive attack of physical force was necessary in order to shut down a political protest. Now, Sammy Alarian's daughter is Lila Alarian, who I've known for a long time. She's a longtime broadcast journalist for Al Jazeera English. She's a graduate of Columbia Journalism School, and she has written for multiple magazines and news outlets around the country, often focusing on the Middle East. And her series on the 2018 travel ban won an Emmy Award. She is, as I said, the daughter of Sammy Alarian and also Nalia Alarian, whom the media attempted to depict as, quote, the wife of a known terrorist present at the Columbia protest. And we're delighted to have her on our show to talk to us about all of this. Lila, good evening. It's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I just went over some of the facts of your father's case, which, as you know, I uh, extensively followed at the time, obviously because of the concerns that I had about the Patriot Act. It's amazing. This was sort of the test case of the Patriot Act, and a lot of people who claim that they dislike the Patriot Act, we're labeling your father a known terrorist. So before we get a little bit into the details of what was done to him, just talk a little bit about who your father is, what he was doing in the United States, the time that he was charged by the Bush administration with these felonies. Sure, well, my father actually came to the United States when he was 17 years old. He came to study here. He actually you know, studied undergrad and then went on to get his master's and PhD. He became a university professor of computer engineering at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida, where he was tenured. Um, he won teaching awards. He was a really great professor, but he also, as a son of Palestinian refugees who were forcibly expelled from their home in 1948, 
He was never allowed to forget that he was Palestinian. He grew up in Egypt where laws actually discriminated against Palestinians. And that was actually what brought him to the United States to study. And he was a, a very passionate advocate for Palestinian rights. He founded a number of different organizations in which he held conferences and published magazines and gave speeches about the Palestinian cause and really was a tireless advocate. Um, as you mentioned, his story really goes on for many, many years, so we can talk about it for hours. But I think part of what um, uh, caught the eye of very um, you know, nefarious, I would say, pro-Israel groups is how effective he was as an advocate and as a spokesperson for the Palestinian issue. And then, um, you know, he was investigated by the FBI for years. Uh, they never really had any evidence to charge him. It wasn't until 9-11 that they kind of took advantage of the situation, of the environment of fear and hysteria and ended up putting together this, uh, you know, massive indictment uh, involving four men. So three other Palestinian men, in addition to my father, uh, with, you know, many counts between them. They spent millions of dollars to go after him. Um, you know, in the trial, they brought dozens of witnesses, including two dozen from Israel to testify about acts that, my, that the government itself conceded my father had nothing to do with. But it was really a way to try to emotionally sway the jury. Uh, the jury was made up of 12 people from the Tampa area where the media had been after my father for over a decade. And you can imagine it was the worst kind of smear campaign you can imagine, very sustained. And yet, and yet. Despite the, the, the environment of fear and hysteria after 9-11, the anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, anti-Palestinian sentiment, despite the resources that the government put in going after my father and trying to get multiple life sentences for him, they failed. They failed miserably. They were humiliated and embarrassed. They couldn't get a single guilty verdict out of this jury. Afterwards, when local reporters asked one of the jurors, what would it have taken uh, or they said, why didn't you convict Dr. Alarian and the other men? He said there was no evidence. And they said, what would it have taken for you to convict them? He said, evidence. So there was no evidence for their their claims, for their um, very sensationalist uh, you know, accusations against him. And they failed. And um, as you mentioned, his case dragged on for a total of 12 years because of the vindictive nature of the Department of Justice, particularly one prosecutor here in Northern Virginia, where I now live, um, who tried to retry the Florida case in Northern Virginia. And, and thankfully, he also failed. So I was uh, doing my show last night and then immediately after began hearing this claim that a wife of a known terrorist was present at the Columbia protest. And I could just tell right away, given the ambiguity of it, given this formulation, that it was almost certainly something that was just fabricated out of whole cloth. And then when I learned that it was actually your mother who they were referring to, uh, I was just so amazed because as part of the reporting I did, I got to know your family some. And I remember uh, meeting with your father when he was under house arrest uh, and got to know not just him and, and his wife and your, mo your mother, but also several of, of his children. I remember walking away thinking, wow, this is like the classic immigrant success story. You have like this couple who are fleeing persecution. They come to the United States because they want to be free. Your father became politically involved in his community, politically involved on a national level as well, and then had his children who were raised in the United States become highly successful and highly educated. Talk a little bit about the work that you've done and the work that your brothers and sisters have done as well. Sure. Well, a lot of us, as you mentioned, are actually working in media. So I'm a journalist. My sister Lemma is also a journalist. Uh, we've both made documentaries. I'm now the executive producer of a documentary show called Fault Lines on Al Jazeera English. Uh, we actually did an episode about the repression of Columbia students, uh, pro-Palestine students called the Palestine Exception that came out a month ago. So before even the encampment. Uh, but that's just some of the work that my program does. And uh, my brother, you know, another brother's in academia, uh, another brother's also a documentary filmmaker, uh, civil rights activism as well in the family. So we're all um, very, you know, sort of active, educated, as you mentioned. And um, as soon as I saw what you mentioned, the, the smears against my mother and the fact that the media was was just regurgitating it, you know, mindlessly, thoughtlessly, it, I was appalled. I mean, this is clearly a really desperate attempt by Mayor Eric Adams to justify the horrific uh, scenes we saw last night, which will be in the history books as uh, a case of state repression and overreach in terms of sending 
uh, dozens and dozens of NYPD officers to remove students from from a building. Of course, we know there's this longstanding tradition of students taking over buildings and anti-war protests. But in this case, uh, he decided to justify it by invoking my mother, a 63-year-old retired teacher who simply wanted to see this beautiful uh, act of solidarity, this uh you know, protest in support of the people of Gaza. She herself, uh, her father was from Gaza. She's lost uh, over 200 family members in the last six months in in Israel's horrific and violent uh, campaign in Gaza. And uh, it was just this scene that really gave her hope and and, and made her feel this sense of solidarity. And uh, it's really shameful that the Adams administration used her presence uh, during a very short time on campus to, in, a, in a disgusting attempt to smear these student activists. And what's equally shameful is the media just regurgitating it without actually trying to do their jobs as journalists reporting it out. So you mentioned Ali Bauman tweeting it out of, of uh, local CBS in New York and then deleting it only after, you know, 1.5 million people had seen it. Um, and then CNN also had a really shameful segment last night uh, mentioning it as if it's some breaking news that a 63-year-old woman uh, visited the encampment. It's simply because th- of the fact that we're a Palestinian Muslim family, that my father was targeted after 9-11 and smeared in this way. That that they And, and it shows you how bankrupt they are, that they actually have nothing against these students, that they're really reaching. It is notable, I think, to me at least, that we've had decades of very similar protests, but those were aimed at the United States government primarily. They're Uh, the war in Vietnam, the invasion of Iraq, the support for apartheid South Africa, the Black Lives Matter protest, and we didn't see anything like this kind of force, especially in the first uh, couple of weeks. And yet it seems like you're fine if you're engaged in a protest movement aimed at the United States government, but the one thing that you can't do, the one line you can't cross unless you want to provoke a paramilitary response is criticizing this foreign government of Israel. Um, Let me just ask you, uh, just returning to your father's case, because one of the things that bugged me so much was, independent of this effort to turn your mother into this sinister presence, also calling your father a known terrorist was simply false because, as you said, the attempt to charge him with that ended in an acquittal. The charges that were actually about him being involved in a terrorist organization, the rest were, there was that uh, produced a hung jury. But after, just talk about the series of events after your father was acquitted and the Bush administration got humiliated, had this hung jury, despite having access to every one of his conversations, they didn't let him go. They, again, as you said, continued to try and pursue him. What is it that was done to him after that acquittal? Sure. Well, after he was acquitted, he actually signed a plea agreement with the government because technically there were some uh, charges that the jury was hung on. And just to explain what happened, um, 10 out of the 12 jurors wanted to fully acquit him. The two jurors that did not want to fully acquit him were the two that happened to read the Tampa Tribune. It's now a defunct newspaper, but at the time it was a major daily in Tampa. And it happened to be the right wing daily that smeared my father for many years. And they happened to be the two readers of the Tampa Tribune. Uh, So it was no coincidence. You see here sort of the role of the media and the press and the persecution and even in the fact that these two jurors, despite being presented with no solid evidence of the government's claims, still would say, well, it's in our gut that he's guilty. That's why we don't want to fully acquit him. When the judge saw, so the judge was able to see where the jury was leaning after 13 days of deliberations. He actually stopped the the deliberations. He was very biased against my father and the other men. And he actually told the jury to stop deliberating. And because of that, they weren't able to agree on the remaining counts. So the government technically could retry my father on those remaining counts. My father then eventually came, uh, uh, you know, reached a plea agreement with the Department of Justice to say, OK, I'm going to plead to this lesser charge uh, in order for this case to be concluded for my family's suffering to end. And he actually agreed to deportation at that point. We expected this was 2006. So we expected he'd be deported that year, maybe the following year. Instead, this very vindictive, extremely pro-Israel prosecutor named Gordon Cromberg here in the Eastern District of Virginia, he's the same person who's going after Julian Assange. 
um, just to give you a sense of who this prosecutor is, um, as well yeah, as some he, of the other post-9-11 he, 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 really he, troubling. He stuff. has brought some of the most dubious post-9-11 cases, charging people with major, major crimes based on the slimmest read. As you said, he's just a pure political activist, a fanatical supporter of Israel. Um, go ahead. So so what, what did he do? Absolutely. I mean, he's made a string of Islamophobic anti-Palestinian statements as well. So very uh, troubling history. So Kronberg um, wanted to sort of prolong, you know, my father's suffering, our family's suffering, and also try to retry the Florida case the DOJ lost so badly uh, in Florida here in Virginia. So what he was doing was engaging in a fishing expedition of some major uh, Muslim American organizations here in Northern Virginia, including a think tank that the government had been investigating for years and wasn't able to charge with anything because it's a think tank. So he would bring my father to testify before a grand jury about that case ostensibly, but what he really wanted to do was ask him questions about the Florida case. So it was really a perjury trap. And it's really easy to charge someone with perjury um, in these situations under, in these grand jury uh, situations. So, uh, but, but however, my father in his plea agreement with the DOJ said, I will not be a cooperating witness. This is something that uh, the government does a lot when they sign plea agreements with people, which is to try to get them to be cooperating witnesses. My father knew that he wasn't interested in that. He said, as part of my agreement, you know, this will conclude my dealings with the government. I will not be a cooperating witness. What Kronberg was doing was violating that plea agreement. Uh, However, because my father wouldn't testify before this grand jury, he was held first in civil contempt and then charged criminal contempt. Again, this was a way for Kronberg to prolong his suffering and and to to try to retry the Florida case, because the questions he really wanted to ask were about the Florida case. My father uh, was charged with criminal contempt. He was placed on house arrest. And as you mentioned, Judge Leone Brinkema here in the Eastern District of Virginia simply didn't rule between 2018, 2008 and 2015, 2014, rather, uh, when the uh, Obama administration, DOJ, finally decided to just drop uh, that criminal contempt charge. Uh, we don't know why they decided to drop it. I mean, it had been going on for so long and, you know, nothing was moving in the case. And he was eventually deported from the U.S. because that was part of his plea agreement. So yeah, I mean, and just some people know, I mean, the, the, the Eastern District of Virginia, where they tried to bring the case, is absolutely notorious for basically being a place that national security defendants go and have no chance of anything other than a guilty verdict. That's precisely why they want to bring Julian Assange to that district in Virginia under that same prosecutor, under all these judges who are absolutely notorious for being just mindlessly pro-government. Um, and, you know, as, you, as I said, I think this is one of the most abusive cases I had ever seen. It's amazing how many people on the right who say how opposed they are to the Patriot Act seem to be perfectly willing to call your father a terrorist, even though he was the first test case of how far they could take the Patriot Act. And they failed in their charge of trying to turn him into a terrorist. When I learned that it was your mother last night that they were referring to at first, I kind of laughed. And then I realized it was actually not funny. I mean, it's just it's it's such a profoundly deceitful way of trying to depict that situation and to suggest that the Columbia protest was some kind of a terroristic threat to Americans. Well, I, I'm, I'm really happy we were able to get you on tonight and to remind people, uh, including me, about the trajectory of your father's case. I'm sorry that you had to hear your mother being described that way last night, but I think people and the fact that this journalist quote unquote, ended up deleting her tweet. I think people understand that they went way too far in in making those claims. So there was at least that. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, It was great to see you. Thank you so much, Glenn. And one last thing, if your audience is interested in learning more about the case, there was a documentary made about it called USA versus Alarian that if you just Google USA versus Al Arian, you can find um, free to stream on Vimeo. So, we will put the link so underneath the, the video. So for people who are interested, and I hope you go and watch it, they can go and watch that to get a sense for what things were like after 9-11, because in so many ways, it's like we're living through it again. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.